Hi everyone, my name is Catherine. Thank you for joining me. Today I'm going to be starting a new show on YouTube called Missing the Missing. And the first episode is going to be featuring Claudia Lawrence, a lady who disappeared from the UK back in 2009. Um, please bear with me, it is my first video. I'm quite nervous. I will be using a script because it's nine pages long and I'm not going to remember it all. So thanks for joining and I hope you enjoy. Claudia Elizabeth Lawrence was born on the 27th of February in 1974 in a small market town called Moulton in North Yorkshire, England to parents Peter and Joan Lawrence. Peter Lawrence had been a criminal defence solicitor before working in commercial property law and Claudia was private schooled in Moulton. She also had an older sister called Ali. Claudia was described as a very kind and caring person with a nice personality and sense of humour. Her favourite flowers were tulips and she loved horses. She had a pony called Dobbin who unfortunately passed away a couple of years before she disappeared. She had incredibly curly hair which she hated and straightened on a regular basis. Claudia had worked in various pubs cooking before she finally landed her job as a chef in the Roger Kirk Centre of Goodrick College, the University of York in Heweth, York. Um, Claudia then moved to Heweth to ease the burden of the travel, especially during the winter months. She loved her job and was incredibly popular, although she didn't use any social media. Neighbours described her as, quote, always very smiley and quite a happy woman. At the time of her disappearance, Claudia was 35 years old, single and lived in Heweth, York, just under three miles from where she actually worked. In the weeks leading up to Claudia's disappearance, there wasn't much noted in the way of any differences in her behaviour or routine. There was some confusion though as to whether Claudia actually disappeared on the evening of the 18th of March or the morning of the 19th of March 2009. But what is undisputed is the fact that the last time she was seen alive and well and heard from by others was on the evening of March 18th, 2009. On the morning of March 18th, uh, Claudia turned up to work as usual for her 6am shift. There were claims that morning that she'd stayed out all night the night before, which would have been St. Patrick's night, big celebratory night back over here in the UK. Um, with a new boyfriend but the details of this are very scarce and the information was only provided to the police a year after the incident. There's no telling if it's true or not um, but there are, have been other indications that Claudia may have been seeing a new unidentified man in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. We'll get into a little bit more information on that as we get through the video. Uh, the day of the 18th passed without incident and Claudia was seen on CCTV footage leaving work with her backpack which would have contained her chef weights. Um, but there are some discrepancies in the sources that I've noted as to the exact time frames when she left work. Some sources cite that Claudia finished at 2.05 in the afternoon with the official police timeline saying this was actually 2.31. Although the CCTV footage is available, there are no timestamps on it, unfortunately, so we're not going to be able to clear up the matter. Um, it is known that Claudia started off on foot to walk home. Um, she is again captured on CCTV footage, stopping at a post box near 204 Melrose Gate, which is on her route home. She is seen on this footage on the phone and posting something in that post box. To date, we have no idea what she posted. Um, some sources again claim this is, was at 22 minutes past two, but the police official timeline notes this as 1447. I'm not sure why there are the discrepancies. As I say, I'm sure those timestamps were actually on the original CCTV footage, so I'm inclined to go with the police account. Somewhere along the remainder of her route home, after posting something at the post box, uh, Claudia was seen by a female work colleague called Joe who pulled up alongside her and offered her a lift the rest of the way home, which Claudia accepted. So Claudia was then dropped off outside of her home address um, at approximately 2.30. Again, these time frames are a bit off. Um, Claudia's mother, Joan, later notes that she had been speaking to Claudia on the phone sometime between when she'd have finished work and arrived at home, so that should have been somewhere between about two to half past. Um, this may have actually been the phone call Claudia was seen to have been on while she posted something at the post box. 
It's unclear how long Claudia was actually at home for, but sources seem to agree that it wasn't long. She left her home again at approximately 10 to 3 in the afternoon. It's not clear where she went because the time frame that she was gone was very short. She returned home for a second time again that afternoon, approximately 5 past 3, and was recognised by a neighbour called Linda Chapman, who had cause to remember this as they had a brief interaction in passing. There is a minor difference which could actually have big implications as to where this occurred. Some of the sources state that it was outside the Nags Head, which is just a few doors down from where Claudia lives on her road, with the official police record, record noting that it was actually a little bit further up the street at the junction of Heworth Road and East Parade. In both accounts, she was heading back towards her home address. The reason that this could be quite important is that if she had brief, briefly gone to the Nags Head, which does appear to be the general consensus, she could easily have met with somebody or been making arrangements to meet with somebody later on. However, if she continued past the Nags Head, um, the next most likely scenario is that she was simply going up to the shops at the top of the road. She could have literally been picking up a pint of milk or some bread, and that is obviously infinitely less sinister. There is a CCTV camera located though, um, on the cost corner at the corner, uh, on the cost cutter at the corner of those shops, which should really have captured her if that's where she was going. And as far as we are aware, she wasn't captured on that camera, so it does beg the question where did she go for that shorter period of time? Then there's a couple of hours where it's believed that Claudia was at home, but it's not known for sure what she was doing or if she was alone. The next confirmed interaction from Claudia was via a number of text messages, which was common behaviour for her, to a few different friends, including Liz, Jen and Steve, the latter whom she'd previously known from the Nags Head and had since relocated to Cyprus. The text messages between Claudia and Steve began at about 6.08 in the evening and appeared to be standard pleasantries and potential for Claudia to be making plans to holiday in Cyprus in the following months. This was not unusual as Claudia was known to love Cyprus and had frequently holidayed there. At 27 minutes past 7, Claudia was known to have contacted her father Peter and the two spoke on the phone. At 8.04 to about 8.14, Claudia and her mother Joan Lawrence speak on the phone. Claudia makes arrangements to spend Mother's Day with Joan, which would have been back in 2009 on the 22nd of March, so a few days later. Um, in case you're wondering for the two different phone calls, Claudia's parents were separated, just in case anyone was uh, curious about that. On the same evening at 8 minutes past 8 until about 27 minutes past 8, Claudia was known to be, as we've already established, sending various text messages to friends. Now, Steve noted that the last te text he sent to her was at 10 past 9 or 9.12, which Claudia didn't respond to and which he found very unusual. Even if she'd fallen asleep, he said it would have been within her character and typical of her to respond when she woke up. Now, I did notice during my research a very, very lengthy article written on a website called medium.com, which I'm not sure how much stock to put into, but it was written by a username Major Lang, who unfortunately does not cite any of his sources, his or her sources, and I couldn't find a way to establish contact with them to question them. But one really interesting point that's raised in that article that I don't see raised anywhere else is that this source notes that the time frame given by Steve could well have actually been in his local Cypriot time. So if he sent it at 10 past 9 his time, or 9.12 his time, it would actually be two hours prior at 10 past 7 UK time. This does appear to fit in much more closely with the text conversation and time frames that we are aware of, but this hasn't been confirmed or denied by any form of authority. Um, but it does appear that the police are running with the theory that it was at 10 past 9. And so that's what we're going to assume moving forward. Um, it may be that this time has been established not by speaking with Steve, but by actually analysing the phone records, which you would like to assume were accurate and based off UK time. Now, there may have been a very innocent reason as to why Claudia didn't respond to this last message. During the last conversation with her mother, she had said that she was tired and intended to go to bed. It had been stated by police and family that Claudia was generally in bed for nine. I mean, she was up early for work in the mornings which would have made sense if she was due to be up at five. 
If she'd fallen asleep, obviously, she wouldn't have responded. However, something to note is that there are contradictory statements floating around as to whether it was typical for her to stay up later than nine. A lot of people seem to think it was and that she would in, in fact regularly text until about 9.30 in the evening. However, if Claudia's comments that we touched on earlier about being out all night the night before St. Patrick's night were true, then it's highly likely she was exhausted and simply ended up falling asleep. Now, at the time, Claudia's car was having a new engine fitted and had gone in for repair around about Wednesday, the 4th of March of that year. And Claudia was due to walk to work the next morning, which would have been the 19th of March. The route she was likely to have taken was approximately 1.7 miles and would have taken about 34 minutes if you trust Google. On foot, that would have been due to shortcuts she, took, she could have taken as opposed to about a seven or eight minute drive um, and a three mile journey in the car. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, Claudia doesn't make it in for a 6am shift. Um, and despite reports of her being a model employee, for some reason, the employer decided not to establish any form of contact with her until four hours after she was due to begin at 10 a.m. Obviously, the phone call they made to her mobile was left unanswered, but no further safeguarding action was taken by the employer. Now, Claudia had made plans to meet with her best friend Susie Cooper that afternoon, that afternoon or evening, I should say, on the 19th of March to discuss plans for making a holiday. When Claudia didn't show up and Susie couldn't get through to her initially, she wasn't too concerned because this had happened on occasion. However, by the next day when there was still no sign of Claudia and she was unable to get hold of her, Susie contacted Claudia's dad, Peter, who went over to Claudia's address and didn't notice anything out of the ordinary. However, he did raise the alarm with the official missing persons report being taken at two o'clock the following day on the 20th of March. Initial police reaction was swift. So as far as the investigation goes, the initial search of Claudia's house revealed that her bed had been made. There were what appeared to be breakfast dishes or at least some form of dishes in the sink and her electric toothbrush was left on the kitchen drainer. So it would appear that she did get up and leave for work as usual that morning. Her blue and grey carry more bag, which she was seen the previous day to have left work with and which always contained her chef weight she would have left with, that was missing. Um, strangely enough, so were her GHD straighteners, yet her ID, her bank cards and her passport were left at her home address. Um, we know that Claudia had plans with Susie that evening, but living so close to the nag's head, you'd think there would be no need for her to bring her straighteners to work because she literally could just call home and straighten her before heading out. She lived about three doors down and presumably had quite a few hours between when she would finish work and when she was due to meet with Susie. So the straighteners to this day have not yet been found, neither have her bag, and we don't know why she would have brought her straighteners with her if indeed she was the one that took them. <clears throat> um, investigation further revealed that at 10 past 12 in the afternoon of the 20th, Claudia's phone was turned off, providing what was described as an explicit detachment as opposed to an implicit detachment record, which would have occurred had the phone been destroyed in some way. This led the authorities to believe that somebody had physically manually powered the phone down as it is generally believed that the battery life on Claudia's phone should have allowed it to remain on for much longer beyond this date. Another interesting thing to note was that during the police search of Claudia's home, they did notice a open bottle of blonde hair dye and some gloves as if she had either been dyeing her own hair or somebody else's at the time. Um, she had had blonde hair for a very long time, yet not long before the disappearance dyed her hair dark brown. Um, yet the poster in the police missing report was, the poster from the police missing persons report that was provided she did depict her with blonde hair. Now she was known to have had blonde highlights put in this dark hair, but I suppose this open blonde hair dye in the home might have led them to believe that she had indeed gone blonde again. But that is a point that nobody is aware of at this point in time, whether she was blonde or dark. At one o'clock um, on the 20th of March 2009, 
a backpack similar to the one Claudia was known to have been wearing or have in her possession was spotted abandoned near to the University of York campus where she would have worked. Quote from North Yorkshire Police, in a grassy area off a footpath which runs between Heslington Road and Warmgate Stray, which is just past the retreat if you were heading towards the university. However, this was reported by an anonymous person who subsequently failed to come forward to provide any more information and the backpack was not located. Further investigation revealed the following lines of inquiry and appeals from North Yorkshire Police. On the 18th of March, so the evening before Claudia disappeared the last time she was seen, a white Vauxhall Astra van was parked near her home on the night for at least 30 minutes from 9.01 in the evening, which was seen on CCTV from a passing bus. On the morning of the 19th March at about 5.35, a cyclist um, remembered seeing a left-handed smoker, which may become more relevant later, with a woman on Melrose Gate Bridge, which would have been along Claudia's normal walk to work. Also on the 19th of March, a few minutes later at 5.42, and an old style light coloured Ford Focus was seen driving towards and breaking outside Claudia's house. Though unfortunately with the CCTV that has been released, we have no idea what action that vehicle took or where it went beyond there. One theory on this, is that it could have been a taxi. Uh, Claudia's friend Liz, who had spoken with her via text the night before, had said that she'd regretted not persuading Claudia to take a taxi to work the following morning when she'd been made aware that Claudia was intending to walk. Um, but I am pretty sure that during the phone records analysis, it would have been clear if Claudia had called for a taxi. It may have been for somebody else though. Also on the morning of the 19th of March at 6.10, a man and woman, matching the description of the couple in the previous report, were seen arguing outside the University of York by another member of the public about 10 minutes after the start of Claudia's shift. Same morning, 19th of March, at 6.45 to about 6.55, there was a man outside, outside Claudia's house. He was seen there, and I'm going to quote this now from the police. A cyclist recalled seeing a man wearing a, quote, matte, sandy-coloured Mac-style jacket which came just below the knee, standing outside Claudia's house. The man is described as white, aged 55 to 65, about six foot tall, with a head full of medium-length grey hair, which appeared scruffy and windswept. Now, what's unusual about this sighting, let alone from the time frame of the morning he was standing there, there was somebody seen in a similar mac though not matching the same description seen outside of claudia's address a few days in the in the lead up to her disappearance and to this day the person or persons within the mac um have remained unidentified on the 1st of april 2009 in the mid-morning a black male entered the co-op store at tang hill in york which is in the local area he commented to members of staff there that he either knew Claudia or used to work with her. Police have yet to trace this man and speak with him about what he may know about the investigation. Further investigation and analysis of Claudia's mobile phone and cell site activity shows that she had been spending time in the Acom area of York in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. And police reported that her mobile phone did not leave the area before it left the phone network meaning they suspect that the person or persons responsible for Claudia's disappearance were local to the area and more than likely known personally to Claudia. This led them to quote publicly in later stages of the investigation. Unless we get information or intelligence to suggest that Claudia came to harm as a result of an opportunity taken by someone unconnected to her, the team still strongly believe the answer lies locally. After only six weeks of being reported missing, North Yorkshire Police reclassified the investigation into her disappearance as a su suspected murder inquiry, though no solid evidence has been released to substantiate the suspicion that she is no longer alive. Um, I'm going to go into a timeline now of important factors that occurred in the years subsequent to her disappearance, just to touch on a few points. 
In May, June time of 2009, BBC Crime Watch filmed a reconstruction of the last sighting of Claudia and a £10,000 reward was offered by Crime Stoppers for information on her disappearance, which for unknown reasons would later be repealed, then reinstated and then withdrawn again. In 2009, a hundred days after the disappearance of his daughter, Peter Lawrence, uh, Claudia's dad, would launch a YouTube appeal for information in which he stated his belief that the internet was vital in the search for Claudia, which is at the end of the day why we're here doing what we're doing in the hope that we can add value and raise some more awareness for the case. In July of the same year, uh, unfortunately, a 26-year-old man claimed he'd found Claudia's body hidden under a bush. He was arrested, given a conditional discharge and court costs after this hoax. In September of the same year, the search was extended to Cyprus, where it is known Claudia had uh, friends over there. And police also searched the biology department of the University of, Law of York. Um, they don't state that they find anything of use. In October 2009, North Yorkshire Police revealed that they were looking for, quote, the driver of a rusty white van, end quote, who was seen in the area trying to talk to women in the days running up to when Claudia would have disappeared along her route to work. But this is not one of the current appeals on the police website, so I'm not sure. I assume it was fully investigated and found not to be related to the case. But I'm not sure about that. That's just my take on it. In November, unfortunately, another hoax message was left on Facebook from a teenager in Oxfordshire purporting to be from Claudia saying, quote, Hi everyone, just to let you be aware that I am okay and I am safe and sound. Speak to all soon, Claudia. Kiss, kiss, kiss. He is later arrested and cautioned. In March 2010, yet more hoax calls initiate a four-day search in Heslington following the first anniversary of her disappearance. The individual responsible for this would later be jailed for 18 months and nothing of significance was found. In July 2010, police investigation was scaled down from more than 100 officers to 16 and then 7. Another house is searched in connection with the case and again, or at least nothing was released publicly that was found. In December of 2011, the Lawrence family publicly asked that the unknown person who'd been placed in a wreath on the front door of Claudia's house each Christmas from when she disappeared in 2009 onwards to stop as it was bringing further grief. The suspected culprit of this was later identified. In March 2013, a book detailing Claudia's disappearance and subsequent investigation called Gone was released by author Neil Root. In July 2013, North Yorkshire Police announced that the major crime unit, newly developed, will review the investigation into Claudia's disappearance. In September of that year, a 66-year-old self-proclaimed psychic of Nottingham is reported to police for harassing the Lawrence family. He posted a, seri a series of really upsetting uh, comments and a really questionable sketch um, and was allegedly the one responsible for laying the wreath at Claudia's home each Christmas. He was sectioned and later passed away in unconnected circumstances. In October, uh, forensic officers begin a brand new search at Claudia's home in Hewith, which lasts for several weeks. Um, throughout 2014, her home was forensically, forensically searched by the Major Crime Unit using what were described as advanced techniques not available in 2009. As a result, unidentified fingerprints were found inside her home and a man's DNA found on a cigarette end inside her car that was, to believe to have be, that was believed to have been from a left-handed smoker. It is worth noting, however, that there are conflicting reports as to whether or not it was normal for Claudia to be okay with people smoking around her or inside her vehicle. I've heard things go both ways. In March of that year, 2014, extensive coverage of the review of the investigation was released, including an in-depth report on the key lines of inquiry on BBC's Crime Watch. These lines of inquiry were placed on a dedicated micro website, which I have linked down below if you want to check out, to support the investigation. In May of that year, police arrest a 59-year-old man on suspicion of Claudia's murder 
and officers search two houses and seize a car. He was later released on bail. In July, a 46-year-old man is, really, is arrested on suspicion of perverting the course of justice in connection with Claudia's investigation and extensive searches take place at the Acorn pub, including digging up part of the cellar. He was later released on bail and nothing of note was found. In January 2015, a killer, unrelated killer, is jailed for life for murdering a man in County Durham. During his arrest, he claimed to have murdered Claudia, um, but these claims were unsubstantiated and even contested by his own solicitor. In February 2015, fresh searches take place of the alleyway behind Claudia's home in Heweth. Nothing of significance was discovered, though arrests would later be made. It is worth noting, though, that this alleyway leads to the Nags Head car park. Um, the Nags Head is obviously Claudia's local and um, an external staircase that leads to the bed and breakfast that is run from the upstairs of that premises. It also leads to a car repair garage. Um, it's unknown, it's never been released, which garage Claudia's car was in for repair at the time she disappeared. March 2015, a, a York man in his 50s is arrested on suspicion of Claudia's murder and searches take place at a house in the city. He is also later released on bail. And there is a CCTV appeal on the 6th anniversary of Claudia's disappearance, showing a man acting suspiciously near Claudia's home around 7.15pm on the evening of the 18th of March 2009. In April, three more men, all aged in their 50s, are arrested on suspicion of Claudia's murder and police search all three separate properties. They are all released on bail and no further action would be taken. In a Facebook post, friend of Claudia's Jen King says... Quote, I've read several articles today and it has served only to make me sad about how off the mark I believe this whole thing to be. It may interest some to know that two out of the four men arrested are close friends of Claudia's and love her very much and miss her much more. It may also interest some to know that all four are close friends of mine and I have the utmost belief, faith and trust in them. I 110% believe that they were not involved in any way, shape or form. Although it is accepted that these that being arrested and questioned was an inevitability, because statistically in these cases it is somebody the victim knew and was close to that is the perpetrator, there is no evidence that I am aware of to tie any of these men to her disappearance. There is beg your pardon, I have known these men for the best part of a decade and I trust them all implicitly. Statistics don't kill people, people kill people. In 2016, the CPS seemed to confirm what Jen had said. Um, they confirmed the men will not be charged with Claudia's murder, citing insufficient evidence to prove that any of them had any involvement in Claudia's disappearance. North Yorkshire Police pledge at this time that the Claudia Lawrence case will never close until she is found and those responsible for her disappearance are brought to justice. A little bit more recently now, January 2017, Police announced the investigation was being scaled down to a reactive phase and would only review new and compelling information on the case. In short, the case went cold. In March 2018, North Yorkshire Police confirmed they had one last line of investigation um, which related to DNA profiling from a partial profile found on a cigarette in her car. This would unfortunately come to nothing. April of that year, Joan Lawrence then comes out and says that she believes Claudia was abducted while walking to work on the morning of the 19th of March 2009. I'm going to move on now to talking a little bit about the portrayal of Claudia in the media and the family response to that. During the investigation, it was established that Claudia led a very full and active social life, including dating a number of men. There was nothing wrong with that in itself. She was a single lady. However, some of these men were known to be married and this started a wave of victim shaming and blaming in the media and there were many disrespectful articles printed that were very detrimental to the case. The focus shifted from the search for Claudia and what had happened to her to questions and rumours about her personal life. Claudia's mother Joan remains hopeful that Claudia is alive and has maintained that faith has helped her through but she has acknowledged the need to be realistic. She also gives thanks every night for what she has, despite what has been taken from her, 
and she also revealed that she writes letters to Claudia about day-to-day -day activities that she's missed in the hopes that one day she'll be able to read them. Claudia's father, Peter, openly doubted claims that she'd led a, a secret life, querying police comments on the Crime Watch programme and sadly later saying that he did not recognise his daughter after the claims that had been made about her public life, her personal life, I beg your pardon. Despite Joan's optimism, Peter notes that after 10 years of her disappearance, it is hard to maintain the hope that she is still alive. Claudia's sister, Ali, also made comments on the Crime Watch segment that seeing how Claudia had been portrayed in the media made her really cross and highlighted the impact that the disappearance has had on the family. There are some interesting points to this case, which I'm going to go into talking about now. Um, there have been various appeals made by the police, which have involved the release of different pieces of CCTV footage from the area around Claudia's home. What's interesting to note is the fact that, according to the aforementioned article on Medium.com by Major Lang, there were multiple other CCTV cameras in the area which could or would have provided much better footage of the vehicles and individuals in question had they been released. Indeed, there are photographs of these cameras and their locations which, assuming they are from round about the time Claudia disappeared, seem to indicate that yes, there should be much better footage available and we should have much more idea of where these subjects had gone after the area of Claudia's home, had they been released. But to this date, there's been no explanation as to why it's not been released, yet I also must say there's been no um, confirmation that it even exists. Something further to note regarding the CCTV is that the footage from the rear of the Nags Head pub was disabled on the night of Claudia's disappearance. Now, although this was commonplace, it doesn't bear thinking about what might have been captured had they been fun functional on the day. Now, we spoke about one of these clips earlier, but there have actually been two clips released by the police of a male seem to be acting suspiciously close to Claudia's house, both on the evening before and the morning of Claudia's disappearance. So we mentioned the 7.15pm one on the 18th of March. This male is seen to walk to the alleyway to the back of Claudia's home. He's off camera for about a minute or just over. He comes back onto the camera. He's seen to be carrying a bag with him. And as another individual begins walking past, he stops as if to avoid being seen by the other individual and then maintains his route once the other person leaves. The second uh, piece of footage is very, very similar. It looks very similar. Um, and it's from 5.07 a.m. on the morning of the 19th of March. Um, the person goes off screen again towards the alleyway to the back of Claudia's home, is missing for just under a minute again, I believe, and then reappears. Although there is the possibility that these are completely different people, um, the behaviour is very questionable and very similar, and the police believe that they are one and the same. Now, some sources state that the initial CCTV footage after being released was subsequently dismissed by police, believing that the individual was actually a landlord of local properties checking on them. Um, it's unclear whether that lead was officially investigated and closed, though that landlord was later found deceased in unrelated circumstances three weeks after. Interestingly, I can't imagine what a landlord would be checking out at quarter past seven in the evening for about a minute in an alleyway or at five past seven in the morning in an alleyway for less than a minute. Um, furthermore, sources seem to suggest that a lot of premises in the area, or at least on that road, were vacant at the time. However, um, this, this might actually go some ways to explaining why that person has never been identified in the second piece of footage, if it was indeed that landlord who passed away three weeks after Claudia's disappearance. Either way, uh, the footage is still released and the police are still appealing for the identification of the individual and we have no way of knowing who it is unless that person comes forward if they're able to do so. So, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the theories in this case fall into two main categories. The first one, as always when an adult disappears, is disappearance of their own accord. To be perfectly honest, I have absolutely no idea why this is so often a, a go-to standpoint. Quite frankly, I don't think it happens all that often, um, and people are far more likely, if they want to disappear, to use the resources available at their disposal, and 
you know, a lot of people actually, despite making a new life, maintain some form of connection with somebody in their old life, whether that's a family member or a close friend. Although I suppose it is a reasonable question to ask, the fact that Claudia was known to be making plans for both a short and longer term future, i.e. spending Mother's Day with her mum and planning various holidays, beyond the date she disappeared, seems to indicate that she had absolutely no intention of purposely vanishing. It has been noted that Claudia knew several people in Cyprus, uh, as we've mentioned. She visited there frequently and may have actually been offered employment there. Although there was communication on the evening before Claudia disappeared with a friend of hers in Cyprus um, and the communication did reveal that she was in fact planning a holiday to Cyprus later in the year which doesn't seem to fit with the theory that she kind of upped and left on a whim and didn't even tell that friend. Claudia's family have also stated that they can't think of any reason why she would want to abandon everything she'd worked so hard for, for including her home and everything in it. Uh, and Claudia's parents also maintain that as both of them spoke to her on the evening of the 18th, she was in good spirits and there was nothing to suggest that there was anything out of the ordinary. There have been unsubstantiated sightings of Claudia in Amsterdam, Paphos and a theory that she was preparing to leave for a new life in, in Cyprus, which have only added to the speculation that she may have left of her own accord to begin a life anew elsewhere. We have touched on this, but we'll go into it again at this point in time. It is worth noting, though, that Claudia had, she had changed her hair colour from blonde to dark brown and then again to put highlights in it before she disappeared. Um, it is unusual for somebody who's planning to disappear deliberately to change their appearance ahead of time, as this would tip people off and usually forms part of the deception post-disappearance. Um... Police did note, however, that there was a possibility that Claudia could have been colouring another person's hair and have appealed that if that was the case, then that person should come forward to North Yorkshire Police as soon as possible. Theory number two, or you know, the main go-to number two, is the foul play scenario, and there are a number of options within this that could be explored. Um, Major Lang from the medium.com source that I've already mentioned, which again, I'm not sure how much stock to put into, but he does raise a good point, assuming this is true. He goes on to write that local 81-year-old Thomas Ward uh, claimed that he'd once witnessed someone bundle Claudia into a car, seemingly by force, and had reported what he'd seen to police. However, there's been no information to corroborate this, and police have not confirmed or denied this claim. It's a very interesting one, though, if true. Maybe that goes some way as to uh, justify why the police acted so quickly when she disappeared, although you would really just like to believe that police would act quickly whenever anybody disappears. Claudia was known to have had a very varied and full social life with a number of interesting characters involved personally at one time or another. It is not entirely out the realm of possibility to assume that maybe a jealous boyfriend finally went that one step too far or perhaps that a clandestine rendezvous didn't quite go according to plan. Furthermore, police have actually acknowledged similarities between Claudia's case and those of Melanie Hall and Joanna Yates, two other British women who disappeared in 96 and 2010 respectively, but there has been no direct evidence to link them. Yates's body was later sadly discovered in 2010 and the journey to identification must have been absolutely heart-wrenching for Claudia's parents and unfortunately this was not the only time that they would be put through such heartache. In January 2013, the remains of another woman were found, um, though these were later revealed to be Lisette Dugmore. Reports also emerged from 2016 in the media that a known killer who has been convicted of the murders of Becky Garden in 2003 and Sean Callahan in 2011 have been, could have been involved in Claudia's disappearance. I won't say his name um, because I think far too much emphasis and credit is given to the killers in these cases and not enough to the victims. But if you want to go and have a look who it is, it's very, very easy to do so. Um, this claim was incorrectly based on the belief that he had an individual a relative who lived close to Hewitt in 2009. However, this relative had in fact died in 1992. Former Detective Superintendent Steve Fulcher, who was responsible for bringing this murder to justice and locating the family of the two, uh, the two deceased ladies' bodies, he, however, firmly believes, quote, that there are correlations between this individual's offending pattern and the disappearance of Claudia Lawrence, 
and has stated that there is a potential witness that came forward claiming that he'd spotted Claudia in physical company with this individual. These are all just theories though, and whilst hypothesizing can help, speculation is definitely not helpful, and so these are the only theories I'm going to go into in this video. There is so much more information available on, on this case, so many documentaries available. As maybe a silver lining in this case, you've got to look for some positivity in the negativity. In the summer of 2009, 10 years after Claudia disappeared, the British government finally introduced Claudia's law, um, which is actually the Guardianship Missing Persons Act 2017, which Peter Lawrence, Claudia's dad, has tirelessly campaigned for and was pivotal in bringing about. This law will allow for a guardian to be appoint appointed in the cases of a person who's been disappeared for at least 90 days to manage their affairs, including any financial obligations. So as far as final words are concerned, um, I'll give a description of Claudia. She is a white lady, around five foot six inches tall, slim build, we believe with brown hair and brown eyes. She was last seen wearing a white t-shirt, blue jeans and trainers. Anyone with any information that could assist with the investigation is asked to contact North Yorkshire Police on 101 if you were in the UK, option one, and pass the details onto the control room. Alternatively, again, if you are in the UK, you can contact Crime Stoppers anonymously on 0800 treble 5 treble 1, or if you are elsewhere, you can by all means use their anonymous online form at www.crimestoppers- or dash uk.org. Um, please stress that no personal details are taken, information can't be traced, and you will not go to court. Please quote Claudia Lawrence if you are providing any information. And now I think I'd just like to leave you with the following words um, and hope for a resolution. North Yorkshire Police's commitment and determination to solve the case and bring closure for Claudia's loved ones is undiminished by the passage of time and North Yorkshire Police will never give up on Claudia and her family. This sentiment does appear to be echoed by Claudia's mother Joan, who states that the current police team are leaving no stone unturned in the hunt for Claudia. Thank you very much if you managed to stay until the end. I do appreciate it, and hopefully we'll get another video up soon. Um, hopefully I will improve over time. If you have any really constructive feedback, please feel free to provide that. If you have any requests for cases that you'd like me to go into, let me know down below and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.